Hi, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Leandro. I work at Blinkist, and I'm the lead engine right there. Uh, we're based in Berlin. And today I'm going to talk to you about two database libraries that Square developed, mostly Jake Warden, but also another his intern called Alexstrong. And it was developed around 2015. And the idea was to solve somehow once and for all what appears to be like a huge mess of how what Android decided to do with their current SQLite implementation. And so before I start, I just want to go and show you the outline for today. And um, so I'm going to start uh, talking about SQLite in the context of Android, then uh, go through the problems and the, the pitfalls and the benefits that it comes, then show you potential solutions that are these object relational mappers. Then I'm going to go deep dive into those two libraries, SQL Delight and SQL Bright. And then finally, I'm going to show like, how they integrate well together. Um, some people also ask me, like, how does this combination compare with Room? So I'm going to quickly mention about that as well. Um, and then finally, we'll do some review. So the first one, let's talk about SQLite in Android. Um, pretty much the same context in iOS, but just going to focus on Android for a while now. And um, sometimes the clicker doesn't work. OK. So why, do we, why Android comes with SQLite in the first place? Well, it's, uh, it's the default that structured for us to store data in, in mobile applications. It's pretty stable. It's pretty powerful. And it's powerful because it uh, covers an incredible amount of use cases. You can store very small amounts of data, as well as hundreds and thousands of rows. And the database, it's a very known standard. And behaves fairly well with constrained environments like Android or other mobile. Uh, it's also very efficient. Um, it's mostly efficient because Android, when, since API level 1, what they, did, they added was they added an interface, a Java interface around the, the SQLite bundle. And it's a very thin uh, wrapper. So like everything that goes through this interface almost has no performance hit. So it's very, very performant. And it's also very powerful. and. Um, more than other alternatives, because especially when it deals with reasonable amounts of data, um, it's also stable. Um, I think the current today, the SQLite that Android ship is 3.20. And I think the first version of SQLite 3 was shipped around, I think, 13 years ago. And up to this day, if you want to open an old SQLite database into a new one, it will work fine. So this is really backwards compatibility, and that's really beneficial because also works well as cross platforms. Because since it's just a file on a disk, you can much, pretty much copy this file and transfer over to another platform and read it from there. So it's a great chance to share data between platforms. But nothing is ever very good. And uh, SQLite in Android has some cons. And the first one is that, well, although SQLite, SQL is an easy concept to learn, to master it's not so well. There are so many corner case pitfalls, advanced operators that are not really exposed or pro properly explained that could potentially help us in many different cases. But because of this complexity, most is dig down into like not really well documented and yeah, not really accessible. In Android, particularly, you have to go with cursors. And as I imagine you guys here today have worked with this before, and it's not so nice API. <coughs> And it's also very verbose, because that's the nature of cursor. You have to write tons of boilerplate code that can potentially be unsafe and crash in runtime. And there is no security whatsoever when you're writing down. Um, so as I mentioned, the, it was already implemented as, a, as an interface on top of the bundle. And I just want to like point how bad, actually, it is just by showing one example that's on the developer Android page. And I don't expect you to read all of this. I just want to point out some details. So for example, this part here. You have to combine strings and do string concatenation. And if you mistype something, for example, like on this, you have to do the string concatenation. Or other examples like here, you're concatenating the field name with how you're going to order that. And well, good luck if you just miss this space, because then you're ordering by something that does not exist. Um, and you only figure out, again, on the runtime. And, but it's not only that. Um, there's also this whole way of, after creating the cursor, you have to query back to get your data back. 
And this is also another problem by itself. So just take a look on this small detail here. You can see that you, once you have the cursor, you have to figure out that the cursor, the, the, the cursor that you are, you have to map it to a column by an index. And then with that, you have to give the name of the column to, so you then get back the Java um, type. And like here, for example, you have to figure out it's either it's long or a string. And can potentially, there are so many spaces that this can break. And also, you don't, have, don't forget to close because, well, you have to always close the database. And ah, no one wants to work and work with this thing. This is really cumbersome. This is really like, not safe at all, not good at all. And that's why there are so many alternatives out there that has been trying to solve this. So we're going to talk about the SQL Bright and SQL Delight. Room tried to solve this. All the object relational mappers um, try to solve this in a way. And so, yeah, certainly has to have a better way. So let's talk now about objective relational mappers and basically try to understand what, what, is, what is an objective relational mapper. Well, it's a technique that allows you to convert incompatible data between incompatible type systems. So for example, you have these primitives like long, integer, byte, string, but the database doesn't understand really like what is the concept of user. And so you have the, the, the people who created this concept of mapping uh, relational entities to make it easy for us to go type safe marshalling and marshalling the data back and forth. Uh, so it's basically, again, is a way for you to convert between those data types. And the way it's mostly implemented is usually a very thick layer around the, uh, the SQLite source. And uh, as you can see here, uh, as you can see in the future, uh, I'm going to show you like, that this can potentially cause other problems like performance and constraints in different ways. Uh, and some examples of libraries that does that is GreenDAO, or Redm Light, Cupboard. On iOS, there's COD data. Well, it's very nice. It allows you to do many things. That allows you to bootstrap your project very quickly, very easily. But you also have to keep in mind that there is new APIs to be learned. Every new library designs the communication between the database and your Java entities or Kotlin entities in a different way. And so you have to learn different ways. And because they try to remove this complexity of SQLite, it also blocks you from trying to customize the way you want. So for example, um, also another point is that it decreases performance because it knows no better than you guys do how to go back and forth between like, an entity that you want or the role on the database. And it hardly allows optimization for consumers because, again, it's fine if the objective relational mapper just queries a list of foo, but once you want something more complex, the library cannot know how you want to do your, uh, your query and can potentially trigger more query, instantiate more objects or less objects, or can even traverse the relationships of the objects as you consume them. And so it can be very, very complicated. Another point is that they usually make the objects mutable, so they can instantiate by reflection. And um, since you're in Android or also iOS, you're trying to query on your database, which is an I.O. operation you do on a background thread, having mutable data can potentially cause a lot of problems. So you want immutability here. Last but not least, the library can also create a locking in effect, which is, for example, libraries that demands you to use different threading, and they this whole mechanism just pops up to your interface layer or presenter layer. And then suddenly, if you realize at some point that you want to switch the implementation, you're pretty much locked in. Because then you have to bring down all those complexities down to the data layer and then swap the implementation. And well, Android guys here know this Jake Wharton. <laughs> and so he once said SQL should be embraced, not hidden. And um, that's the philosophy that they had when they started. They tried different alternatives to, to fix this problem. Alex Strong gave a talk uh, a couple years ago on the Square headquarters, and he, they went through different strategies as to how they would safely map the marshalling and the marshalling of the entities. And some of the experimentations failed, but the, most, the, the ones that succeed then became SQL Delight and SQL Bright. And so there is what I'm going to talk today here. So first, let's talk about SQL Delight. <laughs> So what is SQL Delight? SQL Delight. Um, so basically, it embraces instead of hiding it. Um, it empowers SQL 
and it does it in a type safe manner. It does it, it creates all the boilerplate code that can potentially break. It does everything for you when you're writing down the ID you will compile and it will check it for you. If there is something wrong that you, in your queries, on your models, the plugin is going to notify you. I'm going to show you in a little bit. It also defines a clear way for you to organize your SQL statements in a specific file. And then that allows you to access those in Java very easily, or Kotlin, as we're going to go see soon. So how does SQLite Delight works? Well, it does all its work at compile time. And uh, its purpose is to create type-safe classes to work with database operations. And um, it, when you define your own create table statements, it's going to get that piece of code, and it's going to run its plugin, and it's going to validate, it's going to compile, it's going to create an interface that we're going to go through. But the idea is that everything that can be wrong will go wrong in the compile time. So also, um, it creates these special files, these interfaces, again, I'm, again, I'm going to show you. And all you have to do is to write down on these .sql files. And again, just reinforce all the things goes on compile time. Um, so for example, let's start to a project using SQL Delight. So on your build script file, you just add this dependency, the class path, and you let the plugin. Um, and that's pretty much it. You don't have to worry too much about it. Everything that you define in the build.gradle will um, is already enough. You don't have to go more than that. So also, uh, there is an IntelliJ plugin, not Gradle plugin. And the IntelliJ plugin you can find on uh, any IntelliJ ID. And that will help you with code autocomplete, refactoring, and so many other tools. Uh, I'm going to show an example of that as well. So let's take a look uh, at, at least first, what is the benefits of having this uh, IntelliJ plugin. When you create these SQL files, um, you're going to see on the, on, the, on the video that I'm going to show you how it does syntax highlighting. Also, it does refactoring. It does find usages. So it's, it also does code autocompletion. It generates models after you edit. You can right-click and copy the statement. It gives compiles, a compile error in the ID. And I'm just going to go quickly, like, like all those benefits. There is so many good stuff here that it's not really well known. And so this is like me, for example, editing a, very, a slightly complex um, Query, and then you can see here that like everything is not on the line. It compiles, and as I edit, you see that things will just. So first, I'm going to modify. It's going to autocomplete, and then you see that it's going to break, and then you can fix later. So here, for example, adding another column that I want to, or at least I'm formatting here. It autocompletes. It suggests everything for you. Yeah, that's it. If you try to compile before with those red underlines, the ID is going to complain. So it also allows refactoring. You can like do your shortcut command and rename it. It's going to be updated throughout the code base. And you'll know that what you changed, it's compilable, it's safe, it's going to run correctly on Java. Um, OK, so how do, we, how do we start with that, having those benefits? Let's, let's try to go for that. Uh, one caveat is that the file structure has to be, it's crucial. It has to be following exactly what SQLite Delight asks you to do. And so where you're going to place those SQ files has to match the directory that you define on your Java model. So for example, this is very complex. I'm going to show you very quickly. So let's say I have here my application. It's a Java application for now. And uh, I have this package. And inside this package, I have this hypothetical book.java class. All SQLite Delight asks me to do is to create another sibling folder called SQL Delight and define this boot.sq. And that's where we're going to define all our queries, all our create stable statements, and so on. OK, so I'm going to go see the Java file in a bit, and I'm just going to go deep and dive into the boot.sq. OK, so as we create this file, then we define our table how it's going to look like. So this is a very simple, fairly simple example of a table called book. I define here four columns, some of them not new, 
you can see that they all have the syntax highlight as SQLite Delight S allows me to do. And well, I'm taking this opportunity. I'm going to just write down after that some queries and some operations, like for example, select or insert. Um, this is the area that I saw in, uh, showing in the video. So everything, if you have a typo here, it's not going to compile. Um, OK, then let's move to the Java side. Oh, first, before we move to the Java file, I'm going to show you after compilation what this code will generate for you. So you don't have to browse to this code, but I'm just going to show you how the library implements all its steps. So it's going to create this generated class called book model. It's, gonna, it's an interface, and it exposes you tons of things. As you can see here in the bottom, it exposes all the columns as type safe, just like I defined it. If you remember in two slides ago, I defined its title and author as not null. And uh, it's clever enough to annotate those for me. Um, also, the nullable, so everything is type safe. That's exactly what we want. It's correct. Uh, it's precise, and it derives from the source of truth, which is the create table statement. Uh, but not only that, it also creates uh, mappers. So for example, this is how it would map uh, a row into a Java model. So because the library knows how you define your database, your tables, it knows exactly what is the index of each column. And so it doesn't have to do those jiggling of, I don't know which column is like uh, it's get index or throw and it has no there is nothing of that like all it know it knows already everything for you and it does all this code for you you don't have to write this thing just just an example of what it generates inside so very very nice then after have this interface the thing that we have to do on the java side is to extend this and so here i created an auto value class and uh, parentheses here uh, SQL Delight kind of pushes you and forces you to use auto value or immutability. Um, again, because of threading. And um, well, we can we use without, but I, do, I would not recommend. And then after defining this and extending, you, it will give you two main, um, two main magic that the library uses to do its job. One is the factory, and the factory is. Well, you pass a constructor of the class. You can see here I'm using the method reference auto value book dot, uh, colon colon new. And then having the factory is the class that knows how to create your instances. And because it knows how to create our instances, it's from that that we're going to derive all the mappers that we need. So using the factory, I can get access to all the queries that I define on that .sq file, like, for example, the select all. And so now it's going to give me this static field that I can I, but hypothetically defined as static, uh, that knows how to convert back and forth from the type and save to the Java entity. So having those, that's pretty much all that we have to do. Let's look, let's, let's try to query some books then. Um, let's have a book, dot, book repo dot Java that uh, then queries the database. So this is an example of me querying a list of books. And you can see here that all I have to do, uh, well, on the, on the SQL Delight is to get the reference for my factory. Then I get this select all, and then I get back this SQL Delight statement. What is an SQL Delight statement? It's a, it's a pre-compiled statement. It's like this because it, you can potentially reuse in the future. And you don't have to create this object all the time because it's already type safe. It knows already how, when you pass a book to fill the gaps this is a select all. There is no gaps there. But let's say you were querying a book by ID. Then whenever you pass a string to represent the ID, it would match correctly. And you would not have to recreate this string again and again and again. So this is a reusable entity that Android really asks you to do. And SQL Delight is already helping you with that. Then having this query, I just do the raw query like as we had before. And then this query gives me three fields. One is the statement itself. Uh, the arguments, and the table name. I'm not showing the table name here, but yes, the, using those two, then I get back the cursor. And then with the cursor, we do those magic that we were. Um, the, now we're going to use the magic that the SQL Delight asks us to do. So remember that we just created an instance of row mapper. Now I'm going to pass the row mapper 
I'm going to pass a cursor to the row mapper, and because it knows how to construct those objects, it's going to give you back the type safe entity right there, and I'm already adding to my result and then returning it. There is again no juggling of types, nothing, everything is type safe and it's correct it com at compile time. Um, but that's like the simple canonical example of SQL Delight. There is more features that it does, like for example projections and joins. Um, basically, like whenever you query a different set of items, it's going to create a new mapper because it has to know how to map between what you query for and how to generate that. And so whenever you do a different projection or a join, it's going to create uh, automatically an interface that contains a mapper and a method to create this at uh, the factory, basically. Types, well, they, are, they reflect the types that uh, SQLite defines. Plus, this extra column constraint for Java types, which is a nice way of SQLite Delight to bring the consequences of this database being the source of truth. So for example, here is the types that SQLite defines, so integer, real, text. And then SQLite Delight allows you to say as something, as integer, as short, as float, and then you retrieve those values in the Java side the way you define there. And also, it can, uh, can create different types. So, like, how many times have we created like this integer that represents a boolean, and then you save a zero, and then you map to false or true? So it doesn't have to be this way. When you say, I want to have as boolean default zero, then suddenly it's a boolean on the Java side. There's no byte or anything to convert later. It does obviously other types, um, pretty much like wrong, as you mentioned. Uh, and so all you have to do is to, well, yeah, is to pass the type adapter. Here I have the same book table again, but now I have this zone date time. And uh, just to go back and forth from it, you just pass an implementation of the column adapter. And uh, you create this column adapter, from and to, very simple. And it's very similar to retrofit if you're used to it. And uh, yeah, so it's very similar to retrofit. And then um, you pass this on the constructor of the Java class later, uh, which I'm going to show you soon. So enums, also a custom type. But this is nice because they already provide adapter for you. And so what it does is it's read the value of the num as a string and then go back and forth from that. Also, those complex operations are features that SQLite, SQL gives us. It's like views, for example. So it's the same structure. It changes the, um, so if you like, who is familiar with views, I guess it's a way for you to have a narrower version of your table for consumers. So let's say you have a huge set of data and you don't want, don't want to expose this to your consumers. So what you do, you create a small view with all the data that they need, they care about, and then it's kind of like a virtual table. And then you then just query back and forth that view. Um, the question that you might be wondering is, does it work with Kotlin? And yes, it mostly works. The only thing that you have to do is to redundantly declare the getters. So this is an example of the book again. Um, it does not change from before. And now on the Kotlin side, um, you can see here that um, besides redeclaring all this override, everything works so well. So if I go back one slide, you can see here that I have title as not new and author as new. So now on the Kotlin side, it defines pretty well with question mark on the author and a value on the title and so on. You just have to get this annoyance. But yes, I hope they fix it soon. For migrations, unfortunately, this is the least support part of SQLite. Um, the library has potential to do everything for you because it knows exactly how your statements are defined. So it could potentially even do migrations for you. It does not yet. But there is this um, issue on GitHub that Jake Wharton has been discussing, and they might implement this at some point in the near future. I hope so. And uh, the solution that I have, that we have to do now, is that we have to write your strings on the open helper, or what I've been doing recently, I create a speci special.sq file, and I write my migration there, and then I use the 
that as, as migration. So I just like, get the model from the SQL and execute the transactions. The downside is that it, generates, gen uh, it creates this generated code, which bloats a little bit of your app, but you can potentially remove that from with ProGuard. And I think now, in the latest version, it does the, the .sq does not demand a create table statement. So it, it would only expose the fields necessarily and the query in a type safe manner. So it does not even generate that much code. So that's SQL Delight. Let's go with SQL Bright for now. So what is SQL Bright? So it's basically a wrapper around uh, the SQLite Open Helper and gives it reactive semantics to it. Uh, but not only SQLite Open Helper, but also content resolvers. Um, and then I guess you're all familiar with ArcJava and reactive programming. Um, it updates you as long as you subscribe to that queries. Um, so for adding to your project, also just a simple compile, that's it. Then let's see how we're going to use this. So first, we create this, use this builder pattern, and then we just get an instance of SQL Bright. Um, you can pass like a logger, for example, then, then SQL Bright is going to provide you a more fine-grained logging of, of, as to how your query and how you communicate to your database. And it also has this convenient query transformer. And this is really, really powerful. Like, if you think about how many things you can do with that, you can basically pass any implementation that's consistent across all communications to your database and have it standardized across everything. So, if, for example, you can pass a scheduler there. You can um, log in different ways. You can optimize. You can convert. You can use some kind of Rx replaying share. Like you can put everything there. It, it's crazy. You, you can just pass an observable that acts on the whole stream. And then, after having an instance of SQL Bright, you then create this Bright database that you pass the, the SQL Open Helper and then the scheduler that you want to define when you query. So by now, you can see here that there will be no I.O. operations in the main thread. And um, this is very important. Like, I think this is not so known, but on the, if you just use SQLite normally on Android, and you use something like, and you use an operation, you query the database, it might be that the Android by itself blocks the thread that you're in and creates the table, potentially creates all the, the, creates the database, creates all the table, and this can block. And SQL Bright is guaranteeing you right now, right here, that even if this is the case, it will gonna, it's going to go through in a different, in a background thread. Also, the same strategy um, works with the um, with the content resolvers. Uh, sorry, yeah, you can also define here as logging enable or not, and this is how you would you would use if it was a content resolver. This is an example of the logging that the library provides you to, and so here I have just a query and then execute an insert, and you can see here that it shows the bindings exactly. So we can log this. You can see that you're injecting the correct values in there. So it's very powerful. OK, let's try to make use of the library then. So here we're again on the book repository. Um, here I'm creating, uh, so since I'm here with only SQL write, and I'm passing this string that's the select asterisk from book. And now when it gives me back this query observable, and this query observable, then after executing this run, it was going to give me the cursor, and then I can use it to map my data. And um, yeah, so for example, here, when I have this database, uh, I can have inserts, I can do deletes, I can do updates. And as long as I'm subscribed to this, the query is going to update me. Um, transactions, uh, that's the way you used to group uh, changes to, let, so let's say you're inserting like, lots of data into a table. The way to use transaction in this context is to avoid being spanned by notifications. So if you know that you're injecting 100 items in your database or your table, then you can suddenly wrap this in a transaction and only be notified once. Even if you delete, then replace, then do some magic there, you can guarantee with a transaction that you're not going to be bombarded. And after that, obviously, marks that successful, and then this will be the trigger for you to be notified. 
uh, again, if it works with Kotlin. And well, yes. <laughs> and not only that, but they also provide some library, so some extension methods to help you with that. And so together with the, the import that you do on the SQLbrite, you also add the SQLbrite minus Kotlin. And this will give you all the niceties, like, for example, mapping to a single, mapping to one or default, mapping to optional in case. So now that RxJava does not support nulls anymore, RxJava 2, this is a nice way for you to guarantee that you're not going to be propagating nulls anywhere. So everything is taken care of by you. So having a look at those two libraries separately, how would they behave if they were combined well together? And I think that's the most appealing uh, of when they exist. So they, you can see that they really well complement each other. And so let's just look at an example of how, those li how these libraries work together. So again, I have my book table definition. And it's very simple. Again, I have four, column, four columns there. And a select, an insert on, on the Java side on my auto value class. Again, um, this is just for me to get my factory and my mapper. You can see here that now I'm using a custom field. So I'm just going to go back one slide. This publish it at is the type of zone date time. And now on the Java side, you can see that I pass an instance of my converter, my adapter. Um, and then that's all um, you'd have to do on the Java side. Now let's consume data. So now let's consume some books and uh, get books by publish date. So it's given to us, uh, we would query by a zone date time, a published at. And so now we're going to create this again, this SQL delight statement. And now we're going to pass the parameter that we're querying from. And then it's going to attach the pre compiled SQL delight statement. And it's going to again create the query that we just saw before. And here you can see that it contains all those three fields, which is the tables, the statement, and the arguments. So you don't have to worry about strings anymore. Everything is taken care of by you. The tables are a list of strings that this query connects from. So if you're doing a join, for example, the tables is going to array of two items or even more. And it will, it's by that that SQLite knows which tables are changing, so then to notify you then. And, and here I'm just mapping to one, again, using the mapper. And here I'm passing a method reference, which is the map. And then now. With all, that's all like, that you have to do in order to have a type safe list of items. I just want to emphasize how clean and correct this is, because this is not usually the case with different types of libraries. This is the fair and correct way that everything should be done, or it should have been in the first place. Um, <laughs> so this is like two lines of code. What if we were using this with Android APIs? Well. I don't want to like, go into the details. This is just a joke. No one would write those kinds of things. <laughs> um, so another example. So this is like a real class of, my, of one example. I, here you can see that I inject the database, the bright database. And I also create an instance on the constructor for the insert. So now I can reuse over and over again. So now when I'm running insert uh, here, you can see that I save this reference. And now when I want to use it, I just get to bind. Uh, the statement with my arguments, and then I execute. And then with that, whoever is listening to, to the, this table is going to get notified that this new item was added, and it will just push it to you. Um, well, it's two libraries. And we know that Android has been suffering with dex limit for a while. And many libraries add tons of methods to your code base. And you might think that those two libraries might add that much to your code base, but it's actually not the case. They're very, very small. Like Combining, they're both 106 methods only, plus generated code, of course. And well, it's a very powerful combination. Um, finally, I just want to like talk a little bit of room with, about room. Um, this is not a room talk, so I'm going to briefly mention it. If you have more questions, you can obviously come to me later. So Room was released this year at Google I.O. Uh, it's the database part of the components, uh, the architecture components. And it, their goal is to have it's, it's the same goal as SQL Bright slash SQL Delight, uh, which is avoids boilerplate code. It compile time, checks SQL queries, and allows asynchronous queries to run. 
And um, there is this link that I encourage you to follow. This is the last week or two weeks ago talk that Jake Wharton gave with Alex Strong. And they, now that Jake Wharton is part of Google, they, he knows more about what is going on there, what is the future of the room. And he gives a really, really nice insight and compare both libraries. Um, I read tons of times these slides. I have some opinions of that. Um, but you're encouraged also to read that in case if you want to talk to me, I'm very more than happy to talk to. And uh, with that, I just want to review everything that we learned today. So what do we get from SQL Delight? Well, it's a way for you to marshal and unmarshal your data in a type safe way. Uh, it does compile time validation, auto completion, refactoring, all those magic that you saw. And also incentivizes immutability. It plays really well with auto value. And it's a tool for you if you really live, live in SQLite. If you need all um, data mapping, and it is like it gives you all the power that SQL allows you to do. So tables, uh, joins, projections, uh, virtual tables, uh, triggers, um, indexes, everything's available for you there. Unfortunately, not everything's perfect. Again, the migration is not ideal. On the SQL Bright part, you get uh, also the benefit of content provider support on top of the SQL Open Helper. Then it gives you real UI uh, updates, real time UI updates. And uh, it's also agnostic to the mapper or SQL source, which means that you can potentially use SQL Bright without SQL Delight. You can use a different data source and still have reactive semantics. You don't have to use both combined. It's very agnostic. And with that, I'm happy to take some of your questions. Thank you. Uh, do you get any support for dynamic uh, SQL queries? For uh -huh. example, if you query multiple columns and you can, your user can switch f uh, that you only need to query by two, col uh, two columns, not, not three or four and you have to construct your query on the fly? Um, no, because it, it, it allows you to create um, a different projection, but not at compile time, not at runtime, because then it cannot guarantee that the types that you're going to map back and forth is going to be safe. So you wouldn't be able to just pass a string. I don't think you can even, because the type, it's already, the, the, it asks, I mean, you can pass a string there on the statement, but then it would break because you wouldn't know how to map the the SQLite delight uh, the compiled statement back to your Java module. So so it supports only static uh, queries. Yeah, if if you define on compile time, then it works. Yes, you can combine different objects and have all types of combinations that you want, and everything is going to be type safe. Uh, so let's say that I have an object, an entity in my table, and it holds a reference to a list of other objects, which sometimes is the case. Of course, you can do that in uh, just one table. So are you going to write like two separate SQL statement first to get the object and then from like an ID fetch the other list and then join them together in another object? Or what's the strategy for this kind of relationship? Yeah, I would create a query specifically combining all the data that I need, create a new projection, create a Java model that represents what you want to get from that, and then consume it on safe side. What they don't do is for you to have, for example, a user object that contains a list of, I don't know, um, families, uh, family entities, because that means that if you br then bring this user to the interface, and then you bind to a list, and then suddenly you start to cr like to traverse the relationships of the ob those objects, most object relational mappers will do it on the thread that you just bind it to the UI. And it specifically blocks that because it does, it does not allow you to do UI updates on the main thread. So everything that you need to get, get it earlier and then consume later. It's not going to go behind the scenes and query something that you, and you're not really seeing. There is no, yeah, th this is intentionally designed to not do that. Well, I guess that's it. If you have more questions, just please uh, come to me later. I'm very happy to talk to you about it. Thank you. Thank you.